Parts DIY has the largest selection of mobile home parts and accessories anywhere. From carpet to doors, get the DIY supplies you need for less. The DIY Home Center Outlet. We are your building material closeout store. 2191 Northwest 10th Street, just two miles east of I-75. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 963 FM, The Source. Okay, six minutes after nine o'clock. Thank you for tuning in this uh, Monday morning. So there's a good chance that if you're listening to a guy on the radio, like me, that um, he is a geek or a nerd, or at least has been in his life. I, I absolutely, I probably still am. But, it, but in school I was. And now that doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. It just means that I did nerdy things. Like, for example, joining the debate club. So when you join the debate club in high school, um, there's a cool thing that happens. You learn how to debate. And that's, the, that's the cool part about being a nerd. You enter into something nerdy and you learn how to debate. And so that little, I mean, I, I can't say I'm an expert on the rules of debate, but I think debate as a forum for the exchange of ideas where two sides have intelligent opinions on something that both sides need to convince the other that they're right and sometimes ends in a compromise wasn't such a bad lesson to learn. Um, there were certain rules uh, that you couldn't lie. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't call each other names. You, if, if you told a lie that would completely trump, not, not to use the president's name, but that, that's a word, you, you, to completely trump somebody with a lie um, would... Um, disqualify the whole thing because, because the lie was told. I'll give you an example that happened in school. This is crazy. There was a debate as to whether there were any bass in the school pond. Okay. And I said, no, there's probably not. And the other guy said, well, I saw some. Well, that was a lie. And the teacher said, we're done. There's no way we'd be debating if you actually saw some. So that, this is what happens in politics now, right? What, what is interesting to me, though, is that when you look back in history, you can look at some, some of the debates from e even the beginnings of this country, and even some of them were not as clean as you would like to think a high school debate would be. Uh, Peter Winner has a really thoughtful, provoking, and a book that really makes me wish we could go back to or, or have some kind of a way to have debates in this country, have political conversations, let's put it that way, so that we weren't so nasty to one another. I mean, th consider that the other side is intelligent. Maybe you, maybe you don't agree, but they have some intelligent points to make. Um, and maybe you could even debate that. Let's find out what the book is about. It's called The Death of Politics. Um, Peter Winner is on the phone. He's a New York Times contributing opinion writer and a contributing editor at The Atlantic, covering American politics and conservative thought. He's a popular media commentator on politics. He's a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center and a veteran of three White House administrations and lives in McLean, Virginia. Good morning, Peter. Thank you for being on the show with us today. Peter? Yeah, I appreciate it. Oh, I'm so sorry. Hi. Yeah, good morning. Thank you. I, I can hear you now. I guess I pushed the wrong button. Yeah, I, I, I love what your book is trying to say, and I love where you're coming from. I mean, you clearly have thought about this. And, and are you troubled by the way the current president is political? Yeah, I am. Uh, and, uh, you know, as you pointed out in my bio, I'm a lifelong Republican and conservative, and I voted Republican uh, Every every year that I was eligible, starting with, uh, with Ronald Reagan, so um, my disposition and my history and my inclination is to is to be supportive of Republican presidents uh, and develop Trump to me is in a different category, and uh, and I didn't vote for either him or, or Hillary Clinton in, um, in 2016, and one of the reasons that I didn't, and not the only reason, is that um, I felt like Donald Trump embodies uh, a kind of politics which is dehumanizing and brutal uh, and, and cruel, uh, and I think those, those qualities are bad in and of themselves, but I think that they're doing grave uh, and long-term damage to our civic and our, and our political culture.
culture, uh, and they're inflaming the body politic. They're inflaming um, uh, people on uh, on all sides and making our politics um, more difficult and, and, and our life um, more difficult. So uh, the way he conducts himself, uh, his, his disposition, his volatility, his emotional and psychological makeup are all things that, um, that alarm me. Yeah, can I use a metaphor? Sometimes to me, it feels like a guy who's driving a bus, and we're all in the bus, and and he's he's keeping the bus on the road, and so far we're 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 safe, but he keeps yelling profanities at people that pass him. That that's what it feels like to me. It feels like well, so far so good, but I mean, what do you think about the policies themselves, or is that not what you want to talk about in the in the and not what you talk about in the book? No, I think that's that's legitimate, and, and some of his policies I um, I agree with. I think his court appointments as a conservative, I think his court appointments have, have been good. I think some of his deregulation policies have uh, have been good. Uh, his um, approach on on pro life issues uh, and uh, and some others, defense spending. So, you know, part of the problem that I think and I, I deal with this in the book is uh, there's this children of light, children of dark aspect of politics that, that enters in, and there's this inability, as in some game, but there's this inability to uh, say that anybody that you disagree with can do anything right, or that you and your side can never do anything wrong. And I think Donald Trump's record as president on policies is mixed, but some things I support more than I would Hillary Clinton, again, because I'm a conservative. Um, I think one of the frustrations that I have with, with a lot of Trump supporters, not all of them, but a lot of them, uh, isn't that they voted for him or that they support particular policies. It's that they have become his sword and his shield, that they never hold him to account uh, or, or call him out. I have a chapter uh, called uh, Politics and, and Faith, where, um, where I specifically fo- focus in on evangelical Christians, of which I am one. And again, it's not that I don't think that they, they, they can't be happy that, of his court appointments, but the idea that they won't hold truth to power, um, that they won't say that his avalanche of lies, the, the, the promiscuity of the lies, indeed the, the, the effort to annihilate truth, that they won't say anything about that, that bothers me, and that's indicative of another theme that I deal with in this book, which is the political tribalism that has, I think, so infected politics where it says, you know, the leader of my team uh, is right no matter what happens. Mm-hmm. And even more oh, than gosh, that, yeah, it's not right. loyalty for the, for the person on your team. It's hatred and contempt for people on the other side. Right, teams. right. Oh, my gosh. I, I agree with you exactly. I, I think this every time, and, and, and it's not just picking on Trump. It's picking on politics that as we see it now. And it's not just here. I mean, if you pay attention to what's going on in England right now, they're doing the same thing. They will call yeah. and, and bring it back to America. I, I mean, you know, one mistake, I mean, you see mistakes all the time, just to focus on the president just for a second. When he was at Normandy on D-Day, um, for whatever reason, some, some reporter asked him about Nancy Pelosi. He shouldn't have even addressed the question. He just said, said he, yeah. he should have said, you know what, can we just stick with what we're doing here, and I'll talk about that at a different time. That's, right, that's right. the way we should have, he should have done it, if, if he could take any coaching from any of us. And, and I heard other people saying the same thing. Yeah. Look, I agree, and that was, that was actually, to some extent, that, that may illustrate the issue, because the speech that he gave uh, at, uh, on D-Day uh, at Normandy Beach was, it was, it was probably, I think, his best speech um, the that speech he's given was good. as, as yeah. president. And yet it wasn't just what he said, but the setting in which he said it. He, he was sitting uh, with row after row after row of headstones of people who, in the prime of their life, had been cut down in war and died, and he went after... Nancy Pelosi and Robert Mueller in very aggressive terms. And it was a reminder that he doesn't have any sense of, of, of decorum um, and that he just can't control it. Um, you're absolutely right, and I call out both sides in the, in the book. Um, but what's happening, what we've never had, uh, at least since Andrew Jackson, is a president who is so deeply committed uh, and intentionally committed to dividing the country to inflaming uh, the side, to, to, to cr- causing acrimony, 
and uh, and anger. And the president has an enormous amount of power. And in this day and age, particularly with social media, he has the ability to control the conversation more than than ever before. And I think that's that's doing harm. But let me just say two two quick things. You're, you're so right, though, because if you look through the history of American politics. And really, politics in any free republic, it's always got this contentious aspect to it. The first election in America in 1800 between Jefferson and Adams was a ferocious affair. Mm -hmm. We had the Civil War, where 700,000 people died in a country of 29 million. That'd be the equivalent of 7 million people today that would die. The late 60s and early 70s, where you had riots in the streets, assassinations, universities taken over, the Democratic Convention in Chicago, uh, where, where, where there were, where there were riots. You had Kent State, you had Watergate. I mean, on and on. So this country has gone through difficult times before, and more difficult than we face, face now. So we can't lose perspective. And the other thing, and I deal with this a lot in the book, um, is the importance of pushing back, of not giving into fatalism or cynicism, of knowing deep in our hearts that we have the capacity to, to write new and wonderful chapters in the American story. It doesn't mean that we're fated to do it. It doesn't mean that we will do it. But we have a tremendous amount um, of, of influence and power. We have more, more power than we think to do more good than we can imagine. But that requires us to begin to take back our country and to act as citizens in how we vote and, and how we conduct ourselves as constituents mm -hmm. and indeed how we conduct ourselves in, in, in our communities and our families and our daily lives. Mm -hmm. One person acting alone can't do much, but a lot of people acting together can create a culture and to change cultures can change the country. Oh, I'm with you 100%. I hope people are listening to what you have to say. I love what you're saying. Let me tell you that I think that what I do here uh, not me necessarily, nor my co-host Robin, but what I do here, my profession, is part of the problem. Um, yeah. And it's, and it's uh, ho hopefully I can brag that it's not us. I mean, we really try to make it a level playing field for everybody. We try to be respectful I can tell. to people we disagree with. Um, and th and then express wh why we disagree without be getting argumentative, but but it's not just yeah. it's not just radio because radio is usually leans to the right and it becomes kind of it can be nasty, but television's got the same thing leaning to the left. Yeah. I mean, late night talk show hosts who are supposed to be comedians, they're doing the same thing in the opposite direction. They're just as nasty. Yeah, no, I I, I agree. Uh, I completely agree. There's there's a way in which this is just kind of in the air and in the water, and um, and it seems to be uh, spiraling down. You know, there's 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 no sense. What's 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 happened? What's different? I'd say now today as opposed to to when I first started in politics. Uh, really, when I just got out of college in the late 1980s, and again, it wasn't you know politics ain't beanbag as they say, but. More than at any point in my uh, in my history uh, in politics, there's a feeling that the people who disagree with you not, are not just wrong, but that they're evil, that they're wicked, that they have bad intentions, that they want to hurt the country, that they want to hurt you. And that's just a very, very different way mm -hmm. of approaching politics and saying, look, we have a, a, a difference. Oh, yeah. And let's... let's Debate those differences, as you as you were saying earlier. Um, this that that approach to debate of fact and reason and calm argument is really essential uh, to 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 the country. And right now, we're just in a bad bad period. But I I do have the hope that um, that antibodies uh, are created by viruses. That sometimes <laughs> in the life of a country and in the life of an individual, when certain qualities and virtues are, uh, that you've taken for granted or stripped from you, you begin to see why they matter t to begin with. And I do believe that you're seeing within the country, not uh, among all sorts of people, kind of exhaustion with the style of politics and a sense that we can do better and be better. Um, and that is what has to happen. If we had this kind of situation in politics and people were pleased and were saying, this is great, this is, we love it. That would worry me more than, than the sense that I do get, which is people are seeing this play out and they're saying, we've, we've got to put a, put a stop to it. One of the things I argue in the book is it's easy for, for uh, uh, Americans to say that our politics is broken and our country is fine. But I don't believe that. I believe that our politics is broken and angry because our country is broken and angry. Uh, but just as I believe that if we begin to prepare the country and our own relationships at a state and local 
level that that will that will change at um, at a national level. I have a I have a chapter. It was it was an interesting one for me to work on, which is in defense of the democratic virtues of moderation, compromise, and civility, because I think. There's a lot of confusion about what those terms mean and why they are essential uh, and why they've been essential th- throughout American history. My book is about ideas, but it's also about, about stories, m- primarily stories in American history and great figures in American history from whom we can learn. The book is called The Death of Politics. It's written by our guest, Peter Weiner. How to Heal Our Frayed Republic After Trump. I'm guessing the subtitle is getting some pushback from some of uh, my colleagues in this business. Um, but the book is doing really well. Number one, It's a number one, news, uh, number one new release in the uh, practical politics category. And you're in single digits in every category. Number three in political philosophy. Number five in religious studies. Number three in practical politics. Let me ask you about the religious studies because I think, and you know, I know that people who are church people aren't perfect, but but I think there's a lesson that religion teaches um, about treating each other with kindness. Jimmy Jimmy Carter, whether, right. you, whether you liked his politics or not, this was a kind man. He's still a kind man. Mm-hmm. And I would imagine mm-hmm. all the talks that he did with anybody, whether it was an opponent or uh, another state leader, I'm sure he was always kind and polite to them. Um, yeah. And maybe, maybe in my yeah. lifetime, maybe he's the role model, even though you might not agree with his some of his decisions. No, I think that's right. I think Carter was a role model in a way. I think Ronald Reagan was a role model in a way. Ronald Reagan was a person of deep convictions, and he was a person of unfailing graciousness. Uh, you know, Mitch Daniels, I tell the story in the book, who's a friend of mine, was governor of, of Indiana. He was a political aide for, um, for Ronald Reagan, and he tells a story about how uh, politics was getting heated up. And he and others there had wanted to lash out. And uh, Reagan uh, told told Mitch, uh, "Just remember, we don't have uh, uh, enemies; we only have opponents." And, um, and the person I worked most closely with, George W. Bush, was a person of, of deep decency. So those those people exist. Uh, and you know, for the most part, we've had presidents who uh, have tried, at least now and then, to, to bring the country to. Um, together. Uh, now we don't have that so much. And in the chapter on religion and politics, and as I said earlier, I'm a person of the Christian faith. Um, yeah, I make the argument that, that faith has played an important uh, and noble role in American history in a lot of areas. The, the, the anti-slavery movement, the anti-segregation movement, the pro-life movement, uh, child labor laws, and so forth. So my belief is that politics, uh, that faith rightly understood, rightly practiced, can do great good, but on the other hand, we also have in history, American history and world history, the opposite, which is that um, religion, uh, wrongly understood and wrongly practiced, is like kerosene on a, on a, on a already uh, absolutely burning fire, yeah. and one has to be really wor- careful about it. And you know, I think probably the thing that makes me the most heartsick about the politics today is is seeing the way that a lot of uh, evangelical leaders, uh, self-proclaimed evangelical leaders in the political sphere, have conducted the politics. Again, not that they haven't, they don't have reasons to support some of Donald Trump's policies, but that they have been um, so ferociously uh, strong in their defense of him and in attacking in the attacking. Oh, others. absolutely! They, you go back and you look what happened with Bill Clinton. They they argue the character mattered. They 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 used uh, character as a two by four to bash him upside the head. It's actually absolutely yeah. You you're, you're hitting it on the head. I, I this is let me just tell you part of the challenge of doing a radio show is that you have when when uh, Clinton was president we did a show when when uh, Obama was president we did a show when the Bushes were in the office we've been doing this for a long time and we constantly have to talk to people about the issue at hand not the person yes B- because this is what happens somebody who hates Obama for example during the Obama years wouldn't want to admit that anything he said was good or any. I right. I used a right. quote from his from his inaugural address, and it was a beautiful quote. I can't remember what it is, but the point is, he what he said in the context of what he said was wonderful. Same yeah, thing. Same right. same thing with Trump. He's had his moments. Good stuff. 
But if you don't like them, yeah. you're never going to agree it's good. I, I, I can't get over how people won't let up from the politics. Yeah. You know, when there's something in the course of the study of this book, I, I knew about it, but I researched more for the purpose of this book, which, which helped me understand this phenomenon better than I did, which is what social scientists and neuroscientists refer to as confirmation bias and motivated reasoning. And that's a sense in which we come to these certain positions, including in politics. We think we come to them through this rational, dispassionate way. We analyze the facts and we say, look, this is the best argument on, on gun control or on education policy or whatever. In fact, what politics is about, what much of life is about, is that something else is going on, which we have intuitions, dispositions, temperaments, where we almost instantaneously are pulled in one direction or another, and then we construct arguments to justify the position that we've arrived at for, for other reasons. And that, I think, is what we're seeing. That's always the case in politics and life, but it's so accelerated, so amplified now. And so what happens, the, the, how you see that manifest is exactly what you're describing. It's a sense that if, if, if you're a liberal and, uh, and Barack Obama did something and you would praise him and, and, and Trump or, or Bush had done the same thing, you would criticize him because that's not the leader of your tribe and vice versa. And that's a kind of intellectual and moral corruption that happens. It says, you're not being fair-minded in this. You're not willing to give the slightest benefit of the doubt to a person that you disagree with. That's right. Uh, and that you're always giving the benefit of the doubt to the people that you do agree with. And, and that's got to change. And that has to change, again, in individual lives and in our collective lives. We'll never get rid of it, but we can mitigate it. Uh, to, to make our country better and our politics better. I would much rather hear somebody who doesn't like a policy from a president. I would much rather hear them argue why they don't like the policy than to just be yeah. talking about how the guy is bad and how he has said some inappropriate things. The fact is he has said some inappropriate things. Um, but, I, I mean, you have to be able to articulate what it is. One One of the struggles I think of uh, Alexandra Cort what's her name Alexandra Cortez the, the lady who's the new yeah. the young representative oh, uh, oh, Ocasio Cortez AOC what? yeah now she's young and she's got a lot of learning to do and she needs to understand how this country works and and I would I would argue that she's trying and that she wants to do what's good but um, but she's definitely not being treated fairly by the people who disagree with her they're I mean they're calling her names they're they're yeah. they're just threatening her it is crazy yeah. I, I can't believe they they won't let somebody th that was voted into office have an opportunity to speak her mind and then somebody else maybe uh ted cruz i think they're working together which is a good thing maybe she'll get you know get and nobody's nobody enters any job knowing everything and she's got some learning to do that's all yeah yeah you know, I tell uh, it's just a quick anecdote in the book. It's a story between C.S. Lewis and Owen Barfield. Lewis was a great Christian apologist and children's author and medievalist. Barfield was a was a philosopher and poet. And Lewis, in his book *Surprised by Joy*, uh, refers to first friends and second friends. And he says the first friend is the person who's your alter ego. That's the person where you start the sentence; they can complete it. We all need that. Those are people who see the world the same way we do. He talks about a second friend, who in his case is Owen Barfield. And he said that's the person that your auntie is your auntie self. That's the individual that when you read the same books, they draw all the same, the wrong conclusions from them. And mm -hmm. he, they, he talks about uh, Lewis and Barfield uh, arguing hammer and tong late into the night, um, you know, leaning into each other's punches, um, but unknowingly beginning to, uh, to learn from the other person and uh, an affection developing. And the important thing about that story where we can learn so much in, in politics is that both Lewis and Barfield treasured their relationship precisely because they saw the world in a somewhat different way, because they felt like they could see things together that they couldn't see separately, and that they each had something to, to teach the other. And Barfield later said, you know, when Lewis and I debated, we didn't debate for victory, we debated for truth. We debated to, in the hopes that going back and forth, we would both see things in new and better ways. And that's just a fundamentally different way of looking at debate than if you say, I'm going to get into this debate to beat my opponent no matter what. I won't concede a single point. And 
that again is That's just right. what we have to yeah, yeah. do as, as, as a country. Yeah, if, if we looked at some of the documents of our founding fathers, some of the conclusions that they came to, which was to allow us all to talk freely and to have freedom of the press, um, that's good because it means that we're not going to, we don't have to always agree. And in fact, we should talk about each issue and not the person. I, th- I think this book would do President Trump a favor if he would just pay attention to what you're trying to say. I think he, if he cleaned up his act based on what you say in your book, I think he would be, I don't know, if he wants to be remembered as the greatest president ever, then he should follow some of the things you say. That's what I think. Well, that's, uh, I, I, I wish you would. I must say, I think that he's just temperamentally and emotionally and psychologically not capable of that. Um, <laughs> I wish that were not the case, and I'm yeah. open to being proven wrong. But I think what, what his presidency has shown uh, is that, that ho- the hopes that people had for him, that the office would change him, that he would so grow in office, uh, that he'd become a, well, a, a more compassionate, large-minded person, hasn't been proven. But whether he changes or not, uh, you know, it's up to us to elect leaders who, who, who honor truth, who have integrity, who embody decency. Absolutely. And, yeah. and from time to time we get that wrong, but we can, we can self-correct. Yeah, I wasn't implying that he would change from the book. I was, it was hypothetical if somebody could change. So if somebody running for office sure. now is trying to emulate anybody, uh, take, take, take these ideas into mind. Look at somebody like, you know, forget the issues. Just look at the character of a person like Lincoln or Carter or even Kennedy or Reagan, as you said. I mean, look at the character of those people. Uh, yeah. No, I, you know, Lincoln to me is not just the greatest uh, president in American history, but he's the greatest American um, period. And he was a person of tremendous intellectual and moral integrity. Uh, and there's a, one of his uh, biographers talks about how he had the, he had the, uh, the power because of, of his mind, his ability to debate and debate to wound people. But he didn't do it. As he, as he grew older, he grew more empathetic, more compassionate, more tender. And of course, he's, he's remembered not just for what he did as president, but for what he said mm-hmm. when, he, when he asked with the, before the war that the bonds of affection uh, between us not be broken. And at the end, after that brutal civil war, uh, he, he, he wrote about, um, in his second inaugural, we talked about uh, with malice toward none, with charity towards towards all. And so he was a healing agent, even even as he oversaw uh, the, the the most difficult war in American uh, history. And um, and there are other figures like that in American history that we can uh, that we can look to and emulate and uh, and and reward. Mm-hmm. And if we do, uh, things will get uh, get better in our politics. And if our politics gets better, our country will get better. I loved this conversation. I I didn't know where it was going to go when we started out. I didn't know if we were going to be disagreeing with one another or not, but I absolutely agree with what you're saying. Um, The book is called The Death of Politics. Peter Wenner, W-E-H-N-E-R. I found it on Amazon. It's really doing well. Um, Do you have a website you'd like to recommend? Well, the Ethics and Public Policy Center is where where I work, and uh, to follow on Twitter, it's at Peter underscore Wenner. And as you said, it's for the book, if people go to Amazon, that is, uh, that's great. Uh, the, the book was written in uh, less than a year, but in many ways, it's, it's the product of a lifetime in politics. And um, I think all books, all are, books yeah. are labors, but this was a labor of love, and uh, and I, I hope it shows. Thank you, thank you, Doctor. Uh, great, great conversation. All right, um, we'll be Thanks. we'll be right back. Thank you so much. This is the Source W O C A Ocala. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 963 FM, The Source. Ask yourself, what do you pay for health care? Are you single? Do you pay more than $199 a month? Are you a couple? Do you pay more than $249 a month? Do you have a family? Do you pay more than $529 a month? Yes, you can serve the entire family with health care for only $529 a month. Sign up at any time of the year, pick your own doctor and hospital, ask any